Good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here today. We welcome you. Glad you're, if this is your first time here, we are really glad that you've come today. Um, and if you're returning, you know that we've just finished up uh, the book of First John, all five chapters of that. We've been there uh, going through chapter by chapter. And now today, we're going to finish up with Second John and Third John. We're going to take a quick look at that and see how we ought to live. John lived out the gospel of, of his book in John with Jesus, with the other disciples. And now, as a result of living with Jesus, he's telling us how we ought to live now as the church. And so I hope uh, you're just ready to receive God's word today. Um, and so turn to 2 John. But before we do that, let's pray and start out today. God, thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you that we can... Uh, just be in this place, Lord, to hear your message. Um, God, I just pray that you would speak through these words of Scripture, Lord. May we be changed, impacted, Lord, convicted, um, Lord, changed to, to, to be more like you as we leave this place today. And so, God, encourage us with these words, Lord, and, um, and most of all, help us to be more like you through this. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so go ahead and turn to 2 John. If, if you don't have your Bibles today, it's all right. It'll be up on the screen. Um, but 2 John, it's interesting. He writes this letter specifically to this unknown woman. Now, some people have interpreted that the woman is really meant to be the church. And we've seen in the scriptures, we see in the New Testament, that, that, that God will, will compare his church to a bride. And Jesus is the groom, and there's going to be that great wedding feast one day, right, with the bride and the groom. And so, so some scholars have said this is writing to the church and the future church. Um, but I like to look at it just the way it's written. It looks here that he's writing to a specific lady in one of the churches. And back then, they probably had these house churches. Because remember, back in this time, there's a lot of persecution going on. People being killed for what they believe in Jesus. And so John has probably seen most of the disciples that he knew probably killed and martyred for their faith, for believing in Jesus. And so, but he calls out this lady. And let's see what he, he says about her. All right, so let's pick it up. Second John, there's only one chapter. So we're going to talk in this verse, verse 1. I, the elder, that's referring to himself, I am writing this letter. I am sending it to the chosen lady and her children. I love all of you because of the truth. I'm not the only one who loves you. So does everyone who knows the truth. I love you because of the truth that is alive in us. That truth will be with us forever. God the Father and Jesus Christ, His Son, will give you grace, mercy, and peace. Those blessings will be with us because we love the truth. Now, let's look back at that and see. He's looking at her saying, I love the truth, and I'm so grateful for you because you love the truth. That makes him a, a brother and sister with her in Christ Jesus. And so he's, he's writing this as, you know, I'm so grateful that you believe the truth. And it's almost like my heart is the same way with you all sitting there. I love you because of the truth. Now, what's the truth? Jesus said something in John 14, 6 and says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Right? Jesus was saying that. So Jesus is the truth. Right, and it's his, he is the Word, and and we know there's so many names John gives to Jesus, the Good Shepherd, all these great names, but he is the truth, and John saying that in this scripture, he's like, I I love all of you because of the truth, and that's my heart today is I love all of you because of the truth. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, we're connected, we're family. Right, and so I love you because of the truth. So do, so does everyone who knows the truth, right? He says, I love you because of the truth, and it's alive in us. We don't have some dead kind of faith. We shouldn't live like that. We should live like we're alive, like th there's life in us. 
so many Christians I see around, they, they just walk around like they're the walking dead, right? We, we've got life inside of us. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in this life, we have eternal life. So death cannot overwhelm us. Isn't that something to rejoice about? Isn't that something to walk around saying, hey, I've got something. And you may not have it, but you should want it because I got it and it's good, right? And that's the life that Jesus gives to us and the hope. But look what he says. He says three things here. I want us to focus in on grace, mercy, and peace. Did you see that? He says, that's what God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, will give us. Grace, mercy, and peace. Now, let's just not skip over that. Let's look at that here. Now, the first thing you might think about is like, well, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Aren't they about the same thing? I thought that too for a long time. But there is a little bit of difference, and I want, I want us to see that. Let's start with mercy, okay? Mercy is God not punishing us for our sins that we deserve. You know, our, our sin, all of us are sinners, right? The Bible says all of sin falls short of the glory of God. So we deserve death. The wages of sin is death, right? And so we, we have to understand that we deserve, but mercy is God not punishing us as our sins deserve, right? It's deliverance from judgment. And so, but grace, let's look at grace now. It's God blessing us despite the fact we don't deserve it. It's his blessings. It's almost extending kindness to the unworthy, right? So it's almost like one step above. It's rescued from judgment by God's mercy. Grace is anything and everything we receive beyond that mercy. Let me give you a little illustration to help you understand that. I may have shared this with you guys before. I'm not sure, but check this out. What if one of you, okay, one of you, I won't name any names. One of you comes to my house and just steals everything, kills my family, uh, and, and man, wipes, wipes me out, right? Now, I'm, I'm still alive, right? I wasn't there at the time this happened. But guess what? It would be like me saying to the judge in that court appearance, don't, no, 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 don't put him in prison. I'll go to prison for him. Man, so that would be a tremendous demonstration of mercy. Now, grace, watch this. Grace goes beyond that. What if I were to say to whichever one did that, you have my unlimited hidden fortune that you did not get to when you tried to rob me. I had this hidden treasure, and now I'm going to give you access to that. I'm going to give you, you have the keys, you have the, the combination to the safe, you have my bank account number, you have all of that for you, just for you. See, that's grace. That's beyond the mercy. And so what, what is amazing, John is writing about this. He got to live it and see it. He got to see Jesus die on the cross. Remember, he was like one of the only disciples that was there at the cross watching with his mother, with, with Jesus' mother, watching Jesus die. He saw with his own eyes that mercy. But then he actually even got to see the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was unleashed on all of the Christians, all of the believers there. Holy Spirit, one of the Trinity, right? One of the parts of the Trinity. That's God with us. That's God in us, right? The Holy Spirit can live inside us and we can have the Holy Spirit's power now to go live life as we ought and as Jesus wants us to live. Right, and so that is grace. So John is writing this from experience. He received the mercy, he received the grace, and listen, the peace, the peace. For, for him to have the Holy Spirit, for him to have seen all that, man, that can just put a peace in our hearts. So many people in this world, they're looking for a, a peace in their heart, and they're restless, and you know what they'll do? They'll look to the world 
for all of these things to help satisfy them, to, to heal the hurting in their heart. Um, and they'll, they'll look for anything this world can offer. And they'll even go to drugs and alcohol for some type of temporary peace that, that, that just, it extinguishes the hurt and the pain for just a little bit. They got to keep running to that. But man, Jesus provides the peace that we need with God. Because guess what? Our sin separates us from God. And the only way that we can have true peace with God is through what Jesus did on the cross. And so here we are. He looks at this lady. He, he, says, he writes to this lady and says, I love that you love the truth. And I'm with you. I love the truth. And guess what? God, in his, in just in his amazing love, will give us grace and mercy, and peace. What, a, what an introduction to this, this letter that he's writing to this lady. But uh, not only this, watch this, he recognized her, but he recognizes in this letter her children. Watch this. In verse 4, it says, it has given me great joy to find some of your children living by the truth. That's just what the Father commanded us to do. What's the Father command us to do? Raise up our children in the word of God. Raise up our children, teaching them what the Bible has to say. The Lord wants us to do that. He wants us to parent our children with the truth of God's word, right? And so he's actually seeing some of our children live out the truth, right? And so no matter where your children are today, you can still pray for them that they would find the truth and that they would live, they would turn, repent from their sin, and that they would love the Lord God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. The Holy Spirit can do that. We need to pray and ask God to do that for our children. And if you have children that you're raising up right now, are, how, how much are you teaching them God's Word? How much are you taking time, setting it apart, just to teach them? Read through the Gospels. Read through the stories of Jesus introduce Jesus to your children and show them who Jesus really is. That's what God wants us to do. And he recognized this lady for, for what she believed, recognized these children for the way they were living it out. Um, what a start to this letter. Let's, let's keep going on. Dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command. I'm writing a command we've had from the beginning. I'm asking that we love one another. The way we show our love is to obey God's commands. He commands you to lead a life of love. That's what you have heard from the beginning. So you know what it is? It's just like a reminder. It's, it's a reminder to her. Let's keep living this out. Let's keep loving one another, right? And, that's, and, and if you're loving God, you're actually obeying his commands. That's the way we show it. That's the mark of a Christian. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here. I want you to see this. These people are marked by the tattoos they have chosen to put on their body. Each tattoo is a message that they're wanting to send. But I'm telling you what, look at the, these pictures. These pictures are heavily marked. I mean, goodness, not hardly any inch of their body left. They, they, have, they have been marked right? By messages they want to give to other people. Well, you know the mark of a Christian? The mark of a Christian is to love one another. And if you're loving God, you're loving one another, you're going to show that to other people that you're obeying what God commanded us to do. And God commanded us to love one another, right? And so think about the marks of a believer is showing Jesus to these people, and what better love? I think I, it, it just took me back this week as I was praying over this and I was, I was thinking about the cross. Jesus nailed to that cross, looked out among those people and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know not what they do. You talk about a tremendous amount of love for his enemies. Wow. We should, we should be showing people. Just today, I was just I, I was at an appointment, and this, this, this woman there, she was looking, and she said, you, something just looks different about you. 
And I looked at her and said, it, it's, it's all God. You know, I, I'm, I have joy in my heart. I, I, I have hope in my life, right? And, and that's just God in me coming through me. And that's what I want to show people that we don't have to be down all the time. We don't have to walk around like the walking dead, right? We can have something that people look at and say, what do you have that I don't have? And then we can share. I, I, I just got, I got Christ. I got Christ. He changed my life. And I can be satisfied in him. Hey, am I going to be perfect? No. I'll stumble. I'll fall. But I've got a savior that won't let me go. And that's, that's just pure joy in, in my heart. And so let's go on uh, to verse 7 and, uh, through 9. He's going to warn them of deceivers, okay? He's going to warn them, again, like we've seen in the book of 1 John, it's like, look out. There are people that want to mess you up, all right? And that's still true today. There's people around us that, that want to mess us up and, and, and get us thinking and start doubting what we believe. Watch this now. Verse 7, many people who try to fool others have gone in, out into the world. They don't agree that Jesus Christ came in a human body. People like that try to trick others. They are enemies of Christ. Watch out that you don't lose what you have worked for. Make sure that you get your complete reward. Now, I want you to think about something. So many people ask this question, well, can you lose your salvation? Is that what he's talking about? Watch out so you don't lose what you've worked for. No. Guess what? If you've had to work for it, it's not salvation. We don't have to work for us, our salvation. Jesus did everything, all the work he needed to do when he was on that cross. We don't work for our salvation. Guess what? We believe, we have faith in Christ, and then we have salvation. But after that, guess what? Then we work for him, right? And that's what he's talking about. Make sure, don't lose your reward. How, do, how could you lose your reward? Well, let's look in 1 Corinthians. It says this, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 9 through 15, watch this. We work together with God. You are like God's field. You are like his building. God has given me the grace to lay a foundation as a master builder. Now, someone else is building on it, but each one should build carefully. No one can lay any other foundation than the one that has already been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. A person may build on it using gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But each person's work will be shown for what it is. On judgment day, it will be brought to light. It will be put through fire. The fire will test how good everyone's work is. If the building doesn't burn up, God will give the builder a reward for his work. If the building burns up, the builder will lose everything. The builder will be saved, but only like one escaping through the flames. Now, how in the world can we lose that reward? Tim, what, what does that mean? Well, let me put it this way. If you start to obey Christ, but you start doing it for the wrong motives, the wrong reasons, guess what? It will be exposed in the last day. If you do something for Christ and you've done it to get fame for yourself or magnify yourself or build yourself up, guess what? It's not going to last. But when you truly do a work for the Lord, and guess what? I can't judge your motives. I can't look at Nobody can judge your motives. You know what's inside your heart and your mind when you do a good work for the Lord. Is it for you or is it for God? See, that's what he's saying. Don't lose those, those rewards. In other words, don't get tempted to get selfish. Don't get tempted to do works to, to bring yourself some type of gain out of it. Well, well, what's this do for me? If I do this, how am I going to benefit from this? Oh, you're going to lose that reward if you do it for selfish gain. But when you truly do it for the Lord, guess what? It's not going to be like hay or straw that burns up in a fire. It's going to be like gold. It's going to be like the solid, the solid things. 
and it's going to be tested by fire. Our works are going to be tested by fire. We'll still be saved. It said that, right? The builder will still be saved, right? But the works. So, so John is warning us. He's saying, be careful. Be, car- be careful that you don't lose that reward, right? And so verse 9, you see some people run ahead of others. They don't follow the teaching of Christ. People like that don't belong to God. But those who follow the teaching of Christ belong to the Father and the Son. Guys, I've seen it. I've seen it in a lot, a lot of preachers here in in America. I've seen preachers who who will will say, demons out, right? And they'll have these big service, elaborate services of healing. and, And they'll say, I need your money. Just send your money. And these TV preachers will just gain, gain, gain. Well, guess what? If they were truly saved, I'm not sure. But if they were truly saved, those works burn up. Those works works burn up. When you're doing it for gain, it's not going to last. And so I want us to just be, be mindful of that. We can get tempted to serve for our own gain. No, we do it. Everything we do, we do it for the Lord. That's what, that's what we ought to do. Do it for the Lord. So let's move on to verse uh, 10 and 11. Suppose someone comes to you and doesn't teach these truths. Then don't take him into your house. Don't welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his evil work. This is basically going to teach us that, that, um, how we should treat deceivers. He's saying, don't even let them in your house. Why? Well, it's a, it's a lot like a chameleon. Watch this video right here. Yeah, see this video? Watch this chameleon. It's, it's, it's turning colors. It blends in with the environment and changes to be like things. And so that's exactly, right? That's exactly how we can be. And God knows that. He says, hey, don't even... Jesus, John says this through the Holy Spirit's uh, words. He's saying, don't even let these people into your home. And so be careful with people that don't believe in Jesus. We have to keep them at a distance because we can't get sucked in to, to their thinking, to their beliefs. We have to be on guard. That's what he's saying. Now, I want us to go ahead and finish up. We're going to wrap up with 3 John. Jump to 3 John. I, the elder, am writing this letter. He starts it out like the other one, right? I'm sending it to you, my dear friend Gaius. I love you because of the truth. Does this sound familiar? He he loved this woman because of of the truth that she believed in. And he loves Gaius, his brother, right? His friend, because of the truth. Now, dear friend, verse 2, I know that your spiritual life is going well. I pray that you also may enjoy good health. And I pray that everything else may go well with you. I love this. Because guess what? You remember in John, the emphasis was we have a spiritual life and we have a physical life. That's what it means to be born again. We've already been born physically, but we need to be born again, spiritually speaking. Where are you at today? Are you born again? What's your spiritual life like? He said, John, John says, Gaius, I know your spiritual life is going well. Praise God for that. What's your life like today? Your spiritual life. Is your spiritual life going well? Have you been born again? If you haven't been born again, well, then you don't have a spiritual life. You're spiritually dead in sin. That's what the Bible tells us. But when you're alive in Christ, made alive in Christ, like Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, go back and read that. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 says, we are dead in sin, but made alive in Christ. And so when you have that spiritual life, that it's just like Nicodemus, like he was talking about, you need to be born again. So he's saying this. He's like, Gaius, I know your spiritual life's going well. He says, I pray that you also may enjoy good health. I love that because you know what? We ought to be praying for people and their health. He's saying that. He, he is saying, I'm praying for your health, your physical health. And so where are you at today in your physical health? Are you struggling? Well, we need prayer warriors for us. And it's not, and don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to ask for a circle of prayer warriors to pray specifically over your health. 
that God would grant you that that wellness, right? And and so I pray that everything else may go well with you. So let's take a look at real quick at Gaius because we got three people we're gonna look at is Gaius, um, and then these other ones, Dry, Diotrephes and Demetrius. All right. So let's take let's let's look at Gaius. He says some believers came to me and told me that you are faithful to the truth. They told me that you continue to live by it. They gave me great joy. That gave me great joy. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are living by the truth. See, John was one of the first and earliest believers in Christ. So everybody after that, that's his children. So he can say that, right? Is it my children are living by the truth? He's excited about that. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the believers. You are faithful even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please help them by sending them on their way in a manner that honors God. They started on their journey to serve Jesus Christ. They didn't receive any help from those who aren't believers, so we should wel welcome people like them. We should work together with them for the truth. You know what, you know what uh, Gaius was doing? He was loving, loving these early believers. And you know what? He was sending them out on their way to tell others about Jesus, right? But the ones that aren't believers, they're not helping them. The, the believers are helping other believers to multiply and go and send them to tell others about Jesus. And guess what? He was also faithful in the truth. That's what we see, we see John write about Gaius. So what a believer. Now, let's look at Diotrephes. Boy, I hope, man, John had a list. He had a list of people. All right, now watch this. Look at Diotrephes. Uh, verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes won't have anything to do with us. He loves to be the first in everything. So if I come, I will point out what he is doing. He is saying evil things about us to others. Even that doesn't satisfy him. He refuses to welcome other believers. He also keeps others from welcoming them. In fact, he throws them out of the church. Dear friend, don't be like those who do evil. Be like those who do good. Anyone who does what is good belongs to God. Anyone who does what is evil hasn't really seen or known God. Wow. You can talk about a good list and a bad list. Well, Diotrephes was not on the good list. And, and see what his characteristics were? He had to be first in everything. He wouldn't have anything to do with them. And, and he's saying evil things about, about John and to other people. He refused to welcome believers. He was throwing believers out of the church. Boy, this was not not someone that knew Christ, right? And so then this last person he talks about is Demetrius. He just says one line about this. Verse 12 says, everyone says good things about Demetrius. He lives in keeping with the truth. We also say good things about him. And you know that our witness is true. Let me ask you this question. If somebody looked at your life, could they say this? There, there's a verse of scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 3, and it says, we don't put anything in anyone's way so no one can find fault with our work for God. You know what that's saying? I'm not going to do anything that would offend the ministry work that I do. That, that would, I, I strive to not, uh, to, to, to be blameless. That's what I strive for. Yeah, I'm going I'm to mess up sometimes. But hey, I'm striving to be blameless in God's sight. And so that way people can't look at me and say, oh, he does this, or oh, he does that. And so we got to work. We got to work to be um, building a reputation of God's faithfulness in this, right? And so it's challenging us. But Demetrius is that. He's living and keeping with the truth. As we wrap up today, um, I say this. I, I echo I, it's, like, uh, it's like John is writing, but I'm saying it, and, and, and we're right in agreement says this, verse 13, I have a lot to write to you. In other words, I have a lot to keep on talking to you about. But I don't write with pen and ink. I will not keep going on. Watch this. I hope I can see you soon. Then we can talk face to face. May you have peace. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. That's my heart to you guys. Lord willing, we will see you next week, face to face, where we can continue our journey in discovering new truths about Christ, 
about, about him, just uh, for us to just live as he has lived. And so I hope uh, this has challenged all of us. I know it's challenged me this week. Um, and, and so uh, go ahead and take some time to, to work through some of these questions. And um, just like John, I look forward to seeing you face to face next week.